we'll begin with the chanting of Om three times. Om. शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतेर द्यव शांतेर दिशाशांतिरवांतर दिशाशांतिरग्निशांतेर वायुशांतिरादित्यशांतिव चंद्रमाशांतेर नक्षत्रानिशांतिराप शांतिरोषदयशांतिर वनस्पतयशांतिर गाओशांतिरजाशांतिरश्वशांतिर पुरुषशांतिर ब्रह्मशांतिर प्राम्हणशांतिर शांति रेव शांति शांति रूमे अस्तु शांति ही मे देव बी पीस ऑन एर्थ एंड इन द स्काइ मे देव बी पीस इन द वाटर एंड इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस मे देव बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स मे देव बी पीस इन द हार्ट्स ऑफ ऑल बीइंग्स मे देव बी पीस इन एवरीवन एंड इन एवरीथिंग सर्वे त्रसुखिन सन्तो सर्वे सन्तु निरामयाह सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चित् दुख भाग भवेत सर्वस्तरतु दुर्गाणि सर्वो भद्राणि पश्यतु सर्वसद्बुद्धिमाप्नोतु Sarvas sarvatra nandato. May all be happy and healthy. May all see what is good. And may no one experience misery. May all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies. May people everywhere find joy and fulfillment. Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, 
we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Vasatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jotir Gamaya Brutyorma Amrutam Gamaya Aviravir Mayeti Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Te Namam Pahi Nityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the divine consciousness fill our hearts fully and protect us now and always. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. We begin today on verse number 11. In the verses immediately preceding this, we saw that how a yogi must be, what a yogi must do in order to begin the practice. You see, for instance, verse number 10, which we saw last time. The yogi with his mind and self subjugated, free from desire, that is free from hope, uh, free from possession, that is sense of mind, living alone in solitude, should constantly concentrate his mind. Now the verses that we are going to do today will go into the specifics of what exactly, if we have to meditate, when we have to focus our mind, what are the steps that we need to take? So. Um, you'll see these are among the few verses in the Gita where we, we, it gets quite specific. So we will see that today. We'll chant verses 11 and 12 together. Shuchau deshe pratishthapya Sthirama sanamatmanaha Natyu Chritam Nati Nicham 
चैलाजिनकुशोत्तर त्रैकाग्रम मन यतचिंद्रिय क्रिय उपवेशने योगशुद्ध In a clean spot, fixing his seat firm, neither too high nor too low, made of the kusha grass, skin and cloth, one on top of the other, sitting on that, with the activities of the mind and the senses controlled, concentrating his mind, he should practice yoga for the purification of the mind. So, when we have to actually begin our meditation practice. Uh, what are we going to do? First thing, of course, is sitting. Now, meditation understood as a effortless, spontaneous flowing of the mind toward God, really can be done in any posture. Why should posture make any difference at all? And as we have seen on earlier occasions. if we want to be accurate in the language that we use then meditation really is not so much a practice meditation is something that happens because if it is a spontaneous flow of the mind toward the object of meditation then there is nothing much to be done i mean it is spontaneous right so you don't want to do anything about it but if the mind does not spontaneously go toward god then we need to make an effort to direct it toward god now the effort to direct it toward god is in a secondary sense can be called meditation so when we say now let me practice meditation what we are really saying is that now i am going to make an effort to direct my mind my mind which is scattered on hundreds of different things and objects throughout the day for the next few minutes i am going to direct it toward god so because an effort is involved this is meditation only in a secondary sense so when our effort becomes successful and the mind then become focused on the divine being when that connection is established then there is no more effort involved it you are already connected then you just then you are just being in the presence of god so that is meditation in the primary sense so meditation something that happens and until that happens we have to make an effort to make it happen and through experience it has been discovered that certain postures certain things greatly help in that effort to focus on god because as i said if god is everywhere within us and outside us there sh- doesn't seem to be theoretically any need to have a special posture special things um all these special things are needed only because it has been discovered that these things help in focusing our mind on the divine and in general it has been found that sitting is an ideal posture to meditate on god we might say well why not lying down again there should not be really difficulty so you can think about god lying down as well but we know that the lying down posture has gotten associated with sleep well, most of us prefer to sleep while lying down it's very difficult to sleep i mean horses i think sleep standing <laughs> don't they now and so because the lying down posture had got associated with sleep if we try to meditate lying down the chances are that we will fall asleep and people fall asleep sitting down itself so it's no surprise that um, 
lying down would, would automatically be an invitation to sleep. And therefore, it's been found that uh, sitting is more helpful in focusing our mind on God. Now, of course, when you sit, then a host of questions comes up. Where should you sit? How should you sit? On what should you sit? And then, of course, we have these meditation cushions. Uh, I mean, think about yoga, the popular yoga. Really, it should, you should be able to do it anywhere and everywhere. But now, we are made to feel only if you have a yoga mat, <laughs> then that yoga is effective. Now, perhaps it, it, it does make a difference. When you have a yoga mat, then your mind kind of thinks that this is one special activity I'm engaged in. And maybe the presence of a yoga mat may help. In, it, it, in itself, it is just, it just, just something on which you are doing your practice. But this mental association of certain things with certain practice does help. So then this verse says about sitting. So in a clean spot, fixing his seat firm, um, Shuchau Deshe. Now, Shuchau, Shuchau means it's clean. Now, it can be obviously, it's helpful to have it physically clean, uh, but also clean in a more metaphorical sense as well. Um, by that is meant it's easier to focus our mind on God in a place that is naturally associated some way with a spiritual practice. And therefore, if you have, um, obviously, if you go to a temple or a church, that's obviously a place associated with worship. Um, but even when you're meditating at home, if you have a small personal shrine of yourself, a uh, shrine at home, or, or, a, or a room where you normally would do some spiritual practice, it's good to have some spot at home uh, for sincere spiritual seekers, which is associated with your spiritual practice. And so that is what is meant by a clean spot, a place which is, which you don't normally would use for many other things. Fixing is it firm, sthiram. Among the two, in, in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, there is only one sutra dealing with asana. So all these different asanas we see in popular yoga, they are more a part of Hatha Yoga. But in Patanjali's yoga system, there is only one sutra dealing with, directly with asana, in which he says there are only two requirements for a good asana. And by that, he means asana for meditation. And he says, sthira sukham asanam. It should be exactly the same adjective. You find here sthiram in the verse number 11 stable or firm. So Patanjali says one requirement for our meditation seat, it should be firm. So a rocking chair may not be the best place because it's still kind of moving or a shaky, then you'll be worried about, or if you're just sitting on the edge of a bed, again, not very, very helpful. Um, and sukham. So the second quality that Patanjali mentioned, it should be, it should be comfortable. We know that if you, are, if you are sitting in a comfortable posture, then you can enjoy the activity. Even if you are watching a good movie or if you are watching a, um, some game on television, then if your seat is not comfortable, then you're going to get distracted. So we need, we need a comfortable seat. So it should be comfortable, it should be firm. For meditation, it shouldn't be too comfortable because again, then again, there is a possibility that you may just doze off. So it should be, should be firm and comfortable. So that's what a seat is firm, neither too high nor too low. Now, what should be your meditation seat made of? So here Krishna says, there is one kind of a grass, kind of available called kusha, kusha grass. On top of that, you put a skin. It could be a tiger skin or a deer skin. Some of the 
animal lovers are going to get upset by this um, and cloth on top of it. Now, the question is, if you do not have all these, would meditation be impossible without it? And the answer is clearly no. So, he, he, here he gives, well, these are the things which are helpful. Um, if you are not able to concentrate your mind, uh, do not blame it that, oh, I do not have a tiger skin to sit on. Sometimes your, your concentration might get, um, might not be helped by it. Actually, I remember um, when I joined the monastery, and, um, that was many years ago, um, I was very young and uh, so I had this uh, kind of a regular uh, meditation asana, simply made of a little, little thick cloth and uh, so I was, I used to use that for, for my daily japa and meditation. And then uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the manager Swami in the monastery where I was, um, so he found that in their uh, storeroom, there was one uh, deer skin, uh, it has been there for a long time and he, he said, well, if you need it, you can take this. And I was young and I said, wow, so deer skin, that will be great meditation. So I immediately accepted it. I took it to my room. I was very excited the first time, you know, sitting on a deer skin and because sometimes you have seen it in these uh, pictures like Shiva sitting on a tiger skin or things like that and so just sitting on a, on a deer skin kind of was, was quite exciting. I was again, as I was very young that time and um, after a few days, I returned it. Um, again, it could be just my mind playing tricks but somehow, I became so conscious of the fact that I was sitting on the deer skin. Then I realized after three or four days, well, I used to meditate better before this <laughs> deer skin. <laughs> and and I, I went and returned it to the Swami and of course, he understood, he smiled and he took it back. <laughs> but that was a good lesson. It was a good lesson to see that all of these external supports can be helpful but we should not think that getting this itself, we are just going to go into Samadhi. So, um, if you have these and you use it, that is wonderful. If you do not have it, that is wonderful too. Uh, but make sure that uh, the seat is firm, neither too high nor too low. Uh, get some comfortable seat. Sometimes uh, many people have found it helpful uh, to have a little raised cushion which gives a better support to the back. Again, that is not an absolute requirement. Just see, see con constitutionally each one of us is unique. Um, well, we all have two hands, two feet, that is that's true. Uh, but but the, the, the general physical structure, uh, everyone has some differences. So, some people might find it helpful to have a little raised cushions and, the, and how raised it should be. So, anyway, just find a seat that, that you are able, which is firm, in which you are able to sit comfortably um, and, and of course, the next verses will show specifically how you should sit. Sitting on that with the activities of the mind and senses control, this is the most important thing. So, the, an effort needs to be made to control the activities of the mind and the senses. The, I mean beginning, when you begin the meditation practice, the first struggle is not so much with the mind, it is with the body itself. Uh, to be able to kind of sit comfortably without the my body moving, uh, is it can itself be a struggle in the beginning. But that is relatively easy. Even you are able to sit motionless for some time, uh, what do you do with the motion of the mind and the senses? with all kinds of thoughts and imaginations and what happened in the morning, what happened yesterday or the kind of projects I have in mind. These are the unfinished jobs to be finished, but tomorrow I have got to do this, all the deadlines to be met, all of this stuff will be going on inside. So, the mind and the senses control means that you tell yourself, for the next few minutes, I am going to make an effort not to dwell on those things. Important as the, those things may be, for the next few minutes, 
Swami Turiyananda, a great disciple of Ramakrishna, used to say, he said, when I sit for meditation, I put, and it's a, a, a metaphorical way of putting it, he said, I put a, a sign on the door of my mind, no entry. And so he said, no other thoughts are allowed to come in. Mm. And there are two ways of dealing with this. Now, some have found it helpful that while you're trying to meditate, if some other thoughts come to the mind, um, first thing is don't react. Sometimes even just getting upset. Oh, I'm trying to think of God. Why is this thought bothering me? So, so if you get upset, you have made the situation worse. Um, so one way is don't react. It's, it's, you know, it's like this now that we are sitting and talking here. Well, I'm the one who's doing talking really. Uh, so let's say someone enters to the door. And um, if I immediately react and say, who is this person? What is this person? When is he come? Why is this person come late? Or if you look around there, then, then this kind of, uh, the communication that's going on, that's going to be disturbed. Uh, and so even though sometimes some of our friends come a little late for one reason or other, uh, then best is don't, don't react. Let them come and then they can just come and quietly take a seat and then proceed with the class. So reacting to anything uh, proves a distraction. So if any thoughts come in the field of your consciousness, first thing is don't react. Uh, the second thing is that you can either just keep observing them without reacting and then the, the trick is this, if any thought comes to your mind and you don't react to it, it will not stay in your field of consciousness for a long time. What makes it stay is your reaction to it. Either you like it or you don't like it or you are upset by it or you are angry with it, whatever. The more you react, the longer it stays. So one is to simply, it's like, it's like imagine you are sitting you are at your desk and your desk is near a window and you look out of the window and you see a cloud and you, there's no need to react to it, it's just a cloud. And a cloud comes and a cloud is the wind is carrying it away. So you just watch, keep on watching and then it just goes away, that's it. So one way is just to keep on looking at it without reacting and the thought will disappear. Uh, that's one way to deal with it. The second way to deal with it is don't make eye contact, don't look at it, just ignore it. Um, and so try, see whichever works best for you. Uh, both are equally effective ways um, and for some people one way has worked better than the other. So, so see whatever works best for you. Sometimes it might be in the beginning, it's, you know, what I said was just like a you know, one thought coming, but usually it could be a battalion of thoughts and ideas. Um, and maybe in the beginning, uh, a lot of your time will, if you, if you choose to just keep on looking at them, um, maybe you'll be just looking at them for a long time. But um, if you have patience, then you might discover that, um, but, but the most important thing is look at them without reacting. Uh, and then slowly, the, the number of thoughts coming into your field of consciousness will become less on their own. But if you find it difficult, and I, I would suspect many people do find it difficult to see something and not react to it. And then I would suggest that try the other way. That um, you know that they are there, but you don't make any eye contact. You say, I'm, I'm going to focus on my mantra. I'm going to focus on the object of my meditation, on my ishta. And other thoughts can come and go, I'm not going to look at them. Uh, if you find it difficult not to react to your thoughts, uh, this might be the way for you. So with the mind and the senses controlled, concentrating is mind. The word used in Sanskrit is ekagram. Eka agram, agra means point. Eka means one pointed. Um, when we, our mind is scattered with 10 different ideas, it's having 10 different focuses. And so, kind of bring it all together. And we know 
that when you focus it in one point, then all the power is released. I mean, there is enormous power in, in, in obviously, the, 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 the sun, which powers really the planet on which we all live. But we know that um, the sun's heat does not kill us. Well, <laughs> it is it's, it's sufficiently far away for it not to kill us. But one of the reasons also is all those rays are kind of coming in all different directions. And you know, if you take a, if you, if you just hold a piece of paper in the sunlight, well, it is there just fine. But if you now then take a lens and then you focus the rays of the sun on one point, then you can even burn, burn that paper. So that is exactly how the power becomes manifest when it, there is a focus to it. There is enormous power in our minds, but that power will be released only when there is focus and not just in spiritual life. All great scientific discoveries, inventions, all breakthroughs in any field of human study and exploration really have occurred when that kind of concentration took place, when that kind of a focus took place. So even to discover the secrets in the material universe, you need concentration, you need focus. Swami Vivekananda once said, that is the only way to get knowledge, concentration. And therefore, to have, get this deeper inner knowledge, we need concentration. Should practice yoga for the purification of the mind. Your purification also includes quieting of the mind. Only when the mind becomes quiet, will that, will the divine in our heart truly shine. It is a little bit like if you, let us say, you can, you can, you really do not even have to try it. It is only a thought experiment. You do not have to actually do it. Uh, let us say in a, in a tub of water, you just place one photograph and with the water is muddy and the water and just kind of disturb the water, you are not going to be able to see the photograph clearly. But when the water is clean, and it is not disturbed, then you can see the picture clearly. So one of the reasons we are not able to see the presence of God in our heart, not because God is not there, because the waters are muddy and they are very disturbed by these thoughts. So we just quiet the waters, purify, remove and all the, the, the muddiness of the waters in our mind is created by all the endless hopes, aspirations, anxieties, fears. This is what muddies the water. So the more we are able to eliminate this, and the more we are able to quiet the mind, then the presence of the divine in our heart becomes manifest. Verses 13 and 14. Samam kaya shiro grivam dharayan nachalam stiraha Sampreksya nasika gramsvam, dishascha navalokayan, prashantatma vigatabhihi, brahmachari vrati sthitaha, manasayam yamat chitto. Yukta asita mat paraha. Holding the trunk, head and neck erect and steady, becoming firm, fixing the gaze on the tip of his nose and not looking around, tranquil in mind, fearless, practicing continence, controlling the mind, intent on me, he should sit absorbed, having me as the supreme goal. So, we have now seen about where the seed should be, how the seed should be. Next is about the one who is sitting on that seat in order to meditate. So one of the primary requirements are these three things. Trunk, that is the, the spinal column, the back, the head and the neck. All these three must be in a straight line. The reason for that is that all of our psychic energy, all of our thinking, feeling, uh, all they are, 
that movement occurs along the, the nerves around the spinal column. And when the spinal column is straight, uh, it's a free trans, trans uh, um, what was I going to say, uh, like a spontaneous, easy flow of, of these thoughts. And that is why we will have seen from our own experience, although um, many of us kind of cultivate the habit of just lying down and reading or kind of sitting this way or, you know, sometime like whichever way, the different postures that we have. Uh, again, it has been found through practice that um, the more we practice sitting straight, uh, the easier it becomes to focus the mind. Again, this is not limited to just meditation. Swami Turiyanandaji, again, uh, that same disciple who I quoted up before, he said right from his young age, he developed this habit of just sitting straight. And actually, it is a very helpful practice. Um, so, whether you are eating your food or, or, or you are working at your desk, um, in general, if we kind of keep the back straight, it is also, actual, also helpful when we age. Um, often time we see that with age, um, people tend to bend and that bending kind of accelerates if even when we are young, we have already kind of already uh, made our, our back uh, already curved. So, in, anyway, in general, uh, it is found to it is easier to focus our mind when the, now straight but not rigid, that they are two different things, not like you are just kind of with all <laughs> tension, not that way. Um, so, it should be straight, but it should be rela relaxed. So, be relaxed, let all your joints, all the muscles, you know, it is almost the, the imagery I like very much is like if you say there is this quiet pond or a lake and you just release a pebble a small stone in it and you can just imagine that stone going down, going down and they just, just resting quietly at the, at a spot it falls in. And that's how, that's how we should be. So, you are not, you are not trying to kind of tighten up your muscles anywhere. Uh, just be straight, have a firm seat and just be relaxed. All the muscles, including the muscles of your face, as, as I was mentioning last Sunday. Um, one way, one way of relaxing the muscles on the face is to practice a Mona Lisa smile. <laughs> they say that um, our natural, if the face is um, just relaxed, the the natural tendency of the face, of any face, if it is completely relaxed, there will be a hint of a smile. You are not guffawing loudly or anything, but neither will it be like a long, ser serious, morose or angry face. So, just be relaxed and automatically you will find that uh, um, or if you kind of make an effort to just smile a little bit all the time. Um, and then you will find that it automatically tends to relax all the muscles. It is actually a very helpful practice also. If any time you are, you find yourself getting irritated or angry at someone, uh, one way of um, preventing an outburst or saying something nasty to anybody is to then force yourself to smile. It is very difficult to be nasty while smiling. So, it is very difficult to be angry while smiling. Uh, yeah, really see, uh, because when people are angry, when people want to s s say something hurtful, uh, the, the different muscles come into play and you will see that um, the place is not, the, the face is not very sweet when a person is angry. But on the other hand, no one has seen a face which is smiling and ugly. A smiling face is always beautiful. It, any face in any part of the world of any age group, if it is smiling, it is beautiful. And even an otherwise beautiful face become very ugly when the person is 
angry or like come with this some very strong negative, that negativity shows itself on the face. And so, everyone wants to be beautiful. So, here is a simple way mm -hmm. and an and a inexpensive way of becoming beautiful <laughs> is just smile. <laughs> so, keeping the trunk, head and neck in the straight, straight line, becoming firm, fixing the gaze on the tip of his nose. So, that is one, one thing that, um, now we say why the tip of the nose? Um, what does fixing the gaze on the tip of the nose means? It really means closing your eyes, it does not mean anything more than that. Because so, what Krishna is saying here is not that the tip of your nose is the object of your meditation. Well, we are meditating to realize God, not the tip of the nose, because <laughs> otherwise it is like, what, what I have enlightened, I have, a, I have realized the tip of my nose. <laughs> so, the, so, the tip of my nose is not my ishta, is not the chosen deity. So, the, the, the tip of the nose really means just because you know, if you, if you, are, if you look, just try, look at the tip of your nose, you are not able to see what is in front of you. So, that is really what is meant and that is why the next phrase makes it clear and not looking around. And so, when you sit for meditation, then do not look around to see how many more people are there sitting around you or whether anyone else is watching how long you are meditating. Um, so, meditation, actually all of these, prayer, worship, meditation are practices when you are alone in the presence of God. Even if there may be 500 people around you, but if you are praying, so, you could be sitting in Central Park, you could be sitting in, in Boston Common, you could be sitting on, on, the, on the bank of the river Charles and praying, and there would be people around. But when you are in a state of prayer, um, if you kind of look around and then think, then, then that is not prayer at all. So, no matter where you are, you know, whether you are by yourself in your room or surrounded by people, if you are in a state of prayer or meditation, it is between you and God. So, you are alone in their presence and that is why you should not be looking around. Tranquil in mind, Prashant Atma, all of these things will become possible if the thing required mentioned in, in verses 8, 9, 10 that we saw last time, if they are practiced, then the mind will become automatically tranquil, fearless. If too much anxieties in the mind um, will not, will not uh, not conducive to meditation. Or if you are afraid of dogs, some people are afraid of dogs and you feel, oh, anytime this, I hear a dog barking behind and anytime the dog might come, then again meditation will be disturbed. So, if there is fear in the heart, it won't happen. <coughs> Practicing continence, <coughs> the Sanskrit word is Brahmachari Vrata. Now, Brahmacharya literally translated means dwelling in the consciousness of Brahman. So, as spiritual seekers, we want to dwell in the spirit, the all-pervading spirit. Vrata means discipline. In order to dwell in that all-pervading spirit, I need to have discipline. And that discipline then, all the discipline mentioned in spiritual text, and again Krishna himself will mention those disciplines in the following verses. So, anything in short, in a general way, anything that takes me away from God should be out of my, should not be a part of my life. Anything that connects me with God directly or indirectly should be a part of my life. So, that is the general discipline. Controlling the mind, intent, we have seen already what this controlling the mind means. So, all the disturbances come. You can either just be the witness without reacting or ignore them. The more we keep on doing it, the mind will come under control. Intent on me, again that intention should be very clear. So, when you are sitting for meditation, you know why you are sitting. You know what, where your efforts lie to direct the mind toward God. He should sit absorbed having me as the supreme goal, this is important at the supreme goal. 
when we are meditating, if we see God as only one of the ten different goals I have in life, I mean you can still meditate, it will still bring some benefit, but, but in order to derive the highest benefit from meditation, at least as long as you are in the state of meditation, God should be your highest goal. There should not be any competing goals to that because then again the mind will not be focused. In fact, the best way, Swami Vivekananda recommends it also, is that when you are engaged in any activity, the harmonious development of the mind will occur that in that activity you should at that moment tell yourself my whole salvation, my freedom depends on how well I do this work. And that could be as simple as just vacuuming your room or cooking or you are reading some text or you are praying or meditating or at, you are at your workplace. So every work can be spiritualized. You say, this work that I am doing now, let me do it the best way I can. And if I do it in the best way possible, the ideal way possible, this itself will make me free. With that attitude, you must do everything. And of course, same thing applies to meditation as well. So when you are meditating, when you are repeating God's name, when you are doing your mantra, that time you should have this firm conviction that repeating this mantra, meditating on God, I am going to be free. I am going to get out of this mess of relative existence. This itself will make me free. That kind of, that's what Shraddha means. That's what this deep faith means. When you do it with that deep faith, it becomes very effective. That is what is meant by absorbed in me at the supreme goal. Verse 15. Yunjannevam sadatmanam, yogi niyatamanasaha, shantim nirvana paramam, matsapstham adhigachati. Thus, constantly concentrating the mind, the yogi with his mind controlled, attains the peace culminating in final beatitude in the form of abiding in me. So when this way, getting the right posture and following the steps mentioned in these earlier two verses, when a yogi practices in this way, such a yogi attains the peace culminating in the final nirvana paramam, that final beatitude, that highest goal in the form of dwelling in me. Now when Krishna says me, it is possible to take it literally and say well when you, when you abide in Krishna, which really would make it difficult for people who say well, mm, I like Krishna, but I do not want to abide in Krishna. Uh, well, it is like this. Uh, we will see in these great teachers of the world, uh, we will see them using the the first person pronoun. See, Jesus says, sell all that thou hast and follow me, or I am the light, the way, the truth. Krishna says, in the form of culminating in a final beard, in the form of abiding in me. Later on in the Gita, Krishna will say, abandon all dharmas, sarva dharman parityajya, maam ekam sharanam vraja, abandon all duties and just surrender to me. Now, this me, if you and I were to say, these would be very egoistic statements. So when we say, follow me, so when you and I use the word I or me, who exactly are we referring to? And, I, and we have seen this several times before. When, I, when you and I say I, we are me, which really is my body, my mind, this whole personality is included in my me. But when Krishna or Jesus or Buddha or Ramakrishna, when they say I or me, if they also refer to their body, mind and everything, 
then there is, what's the difference? Then they're just like you and me. But we know that um, they are special. That if they were not special, there is no reason why we should have been even reading these words of Krishna today. And what is, where does that specialty lie? That when these great ones, they say I or me, they mean the real I, the real me, which is hidden below these coverings of the body, mind and ego. So when Krishna says me, when Jesus says me, when Buddha says me, it means the spirit. So peace. So whenever you see Krishna saying me, and in the text, in the translation, you'll find it with a capital M, meaning it's not just the ordinary me. It's not the historical Krishna. It's, it's the truth that stands behind Krishna. So culminating in the final beatitude in the form abiding in the spirit or in the divine being, that's the idea. Any thoughts, questions, ideas about these five verses that we have seen today? Yeah. Vikram? Swamiji, to take the analogy you gave of the cloud coming as mm -hmm. a distraction, mm -hmm. at that moment, can you expand the analogies to, to say what would we replace the cloud with? So our mantra or our japa, is that also a cloud? Is it a mountain? Is it in a visual sense? Wh what is that? I, I, I'm not too keen on extending that analogy, but maybe <laughs> a golden cloud. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but I guess my challenge. Is no, I, I mean, I, I would hesitate to uh, extend that analogy because I mean, if it's a cloud, then you know, with the breeze, it'll also be blown away. So I wouldn't really like to call it a cloud. But in in some ways, you see, it's like this: when we try to meditate, when we use a mantra to chant, a mantra is a sound. Now you're not saying your mantra aloud; you're saying it mentally, but you are able to hear it inside. So it is a sound which only you can hear. Now, and when you try to visualize the form of your ishta, so there are these two things you are dealing with. There is the sound of the mantra, and there is the form of the ishta. Now, all other clouds or the distractions which occur are either some sounds, because either thought, even thoughts that come to the mind are really, um, I mean, what is a thought? When you say, oh, I, I'm, I'm thinking. Now, thinking also needs words. Uh, thinking is a kind of a, you know, people have, sometimes even you say, oh, I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, what essentially is happening is there's some kind of an inner conversation going on. So there are these words used. So it's going on inside. So the distractions or the clouds that come are either some kind of a sound or some kind of a form. And um, one way, again, metaphorically, don't try to visualize it, but uh, metaphorically, really what we would want to do is that any sound that is a distraction, it should be dissolved into the sound of the mantra. That is, the sound of the mantra alone should remain in the field of your consciousness. Any other form, mental form, because your eyes are closed, you're looking at the tip of your nose. Your eyes are closed. You're not actually seeing the forms with the open eyes, but your mind. So that's the memory. The mind is all those forms come into the mind. So all those forms are to be are ideally melted or merged in the form. So essentially what our effort is, is to hold on to one form and one sound. And any other form, any other sound is a distraction. Try to get that distra distraction out in whichever way works best for you. There is not just one way. There is no magic in it. There is no simple formula. It needs struggle. Uh, meditation is, is a struggle. Those who are uh, afraid to struggle will not be able to make progress. So external struggle needs you know, if you are just having a physical threat, then you need a muscle power. Um, but this is an internal struggle. So your muscle power is really of no use. What you need, need, need here is um, what Swami Vivekananda sometimes called um, nerves of steel. 
one of the oft quoted words of Swami Vivekananda is, what we want are muscles of iron and nerves of steel. Now, muscles of iron are great. If you can have some good muscle, uh, we need physical strength and that is very helpful. But in meditation, um, physical strength has very limited role to play. What we need there is nerves of steel. So, weak nerves can easily get distracted. A weak nerves will not be able to either not react or, or, or ignore the distraction that comes. So, the nerves of steel would be the nerves are so strong that uh, they are the ones who are the best vehicles for the willpower to flow through. So, we need to, and that occurs through uh, inner, inner discipline, which is why discipline is so important because the more disciplined our life becomes and the verses that follow will, will entail what that discipline means, um, the stronger our nerves become. And the stronger the nerves are, the better we are able to deal with life situations. Clearly, there can be difficult situations in life, in family, among friends, at the workplace. And in order to deal with these situations in an intelligent way, in a calm way, in a harmonious way, uh, we need inner discipline, we need strong nerves. If we are not able to deal with the challenges in the external world, how will we be able to deal with the challenges in the internal world? So, spiritual life is for the brave, the courageous, not for cowards. So, Vivekananda was very fond of quoting this uh, verse from the, from the Upanishad. Naya matma balahine na lapyaha. This atman cannot be reached by the, by the weak, by the cowards. So, we have to be strong. That is the idea. Irina? Short question. Uh, do, I, do I understand right? Wow. Do I understand right? Um, we can experience uh, different degrees of peace inside, right? So it's depth, depth of this, or what, what kind of. So it's for me just right now to understand that it's just different degrees. Sure. Right? Yeah, there are degrees of peace, of course. Yeah. There is a peace we can understand <laughs> and there is a peace which we cannot understand. That is why in the Bible speaks about peace that passeth understanding. So let us first try to get peace that we understand. <laughs> <It's slowly. laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Swamiji, that meditation is a focus in one point and it could be your ishta or mantra to order to practice and then you merge into it. And I have seen that artists when they paint something and they forget everything, but that also a focus in one point. And if someone can focus in one point, can get, uh, you know, enlightenment. Um, What's the difference? No, I think I think there is a difference between concentration and meditation. So if you if you are able to focus your mind, whatever it is that you are focusing the mind on, it will reveal its secret to you. So if I'm focusing my mind on say a scientific experiment in a laboratory. I might discover something new which will be great, but that does not automatically mean that I will become enlightened. Because if my focus of my mind is on the spirit, then everything about the spirit will be revealed to me. If my focus of the mind is something else, then everything about that will be revealed to me. Yeah. Yeah, so. Can the breath or sensations be substitutes for a mantra or anything else that may be related to what we call divine. So just the body sensations and breath, if that becomes the primary focus of one's concentration, can well, that be useful? Focusing on the breath will help in withdrawing the mind from everything else. So then 
the breath becomes your object of awareness. Um, you will become enlightened about your breath, but if you want to be enlightened about God or about the spirit, then uh, simply focusing on the breath is a good preliminary practice in order to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring it in one place. But after the mind has come in one place, you have to decide where you want to put it. So that's, I think at that point, simply focusing on the breath will, the, the function is done. I mean, something needs to be done more than that after that. Yeah. yeah, that is why sometimes we are, um, I have seen some people and um, I've, they say, uh, I'm into Buddhism. Okay, and then I sometimes have asked them, oh, uh, that's wonderful. So what do you do? And they said, well, I, I just focus on my breath. Which is, a, which is a helpful practice, but, but just focusing on the breath, there is nothing terribly Buddhistic about it. I mean, everyone breathes. Buddhists breathe and non-Buddhists also breathe. And paying attention to the breath itself is not a Buddhist practice. It's a helpful practice, but not, nothing specially Buddhist about it. After focusing on the breath and the mind has attained a measure of calm and peace. After that, say, if I meditate on the, the four noble truths of the Buddha or some of the other uh, meditation techniques specific to Buddhism, then we can say I'm practicing Buddhism. So in, in today's times, focusing on the breath and attaining that measure of awareness uh, have become very popular practices. And they are very helpful, no denying the fact that they do help in bringing a measure of calmness and, and focus. They're really helpful and many people have found great benefit from it. But to think that that itself is a spiritual practice, I have reservations about it because I think that after the mind is quieted, you really have to do what, what does this quiet mind do next? That's the thing. Okay, so we will um, resume next, next week from verse 16. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhu We bow down to Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. On this Sunday, on the 28th, uh, we will have a Durga Puja here. So instead of the 11 o'clock satsang, uh, the puja will begin at 10.30 in the morning. And as always, there will be prayer, worship, meditation, flower offering, and then prasad. So all of you are welcome. It might go up to 1 o'clock. Uh, so you are welcome for the puja on Sunday. Because there is puja on Sunday, on Saturday we will not have the arati and meditation because we have to get the place ready for puja. Next Tuesday we will have the arati meditation as usual and also the, the Gita class. We will conclude with a prayer now. See the page 3 of your books. Om. May the divine being, who is the father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the great spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, 
grace and love. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all.